I'm gonna go from woo woo to like matter of fact. Like it's basically shit or get off the pot. If you wanna change your life, what are you doing to change it? What choices are you making every day? This is one plus one equals two. You wrote Big Love. You know, you have 300,000 plus followers on Facebook. You've written a movie. You've moved to the most remarkable places and, and had some of the most challenging experiences that I think I've ever heard. You're, you're super revealing. Why aren't you more famous? So funny. I mean, I can't answer that. I, cause I, who knows? I don't know. What I'm noticing about my myself is it's harder for me to do the things that I don't feel called to do. And, and what I'm realizing even more all the time is that all of the things that I want to achieve or want to have, it's all because I want to feel good, right? It's mm -hmm. like, we want these things, whether it's success or money or a great car or a beautiful relationship, we believe that by having these things, we're going to feel good. And so I'm giving more of my energy to like feeling good right now and letting that be the driving force and see what feeling good creates instead of feeling like I have to have those things in order to feel good. What if we focus on the feeling now? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where my headspace is. You're catching me in that, in that frame in that, of in that moment. Right yeah. Yeah. No, you know, I, I have really... friends who've written books and obviously, you know, it takes, <laughs> Uh, nine months, a year, a year and a half to write. And then you have to go through the editing and the publishing process, which takes a year. And so there's always this cycle of, you know, I did look and I went, okay, it's 2017 version of you. Yeah. It's probably written in 2015 or 16 version of you, which is ages ago. And you're telling these stories that you've been able to draw on from all of these moments of your life. I can understand why at this point you're like, you know, if you come onto a show like this, you're like, okay, which chapter are they going to pick out that I'm going to have to dig into and talk about, you know, again. And so I'm, I'm not surprised to hear where you're like, you know what, I've done it. Um, it was a great process. I'm glad it's out in the world. I'm glad that it's inspiring people, but what's next? Like, did you kind of like when the book was done and you closed it and you put it to bed and it's just like, you're just kind of, you've said it and you're done and, and you've said what you need to say and you're ready for more. I mean, not totally because the themes in Big Love are evergreen themes. You know, I'm writing about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a huge theme in my life. I'm a, a big believer in the power of forgiveness and an advocate for it. So that, that will never die in me, even though I'm in a different place now than when I wrote Big Love. Like the power of forgiveness in me and what I've learned through that and, and what I feel about it is every bit as deep in me as it was. When I write about love in there, it's like all of those themes are, I, I don't feel like I've transcended anything that I was writing about in there. I feel like those core beliefs are still what I believe about those things. Probably for the most part, I'd have to go chapter to chapter. <laughs> like it's all, you know what I mean? It's all truth. It's just like, yeah, I'm not saying they're lies. I didn't mean to suggest that <laughs> No, no, no. at all. You know what I mean? It's just, it's like, I've talked so much about and written about empathy and I've written and talked about empathy in a way that I, I align, have aligned with and feel has touched people. And I still align with a lot of that. And yet I'm now it's like, I think empathy is incredibly important. And yet I'm more focused on compassion. And I was always focused on compassion, but I was giving a lot more energy to empathy and really like being with a person where they are as much as you're able to be. And I think that's a critically important thing. And sometimes I, what I, what I see is sometimes we take it to an extreme. I've taken it to an extreme and what happens, and I'm an extremely empathic person and I'm very sensitive and I feel a lot, you know, and that feeling a lot doesn't always feel good, you know, <laughs> and maybe you can relate to that, you know, sensitive, there's a lot of sensitive people out there and you don't even have to be that sensitive right now to feel a lot because the world is so intense that even like stoic brick walls are still like, Oh my God, it's a lot to feel. Um, but it's like, there's something beautiful about empathizing with the person. And yet I'm, and there's something wildly powerful about staying in, 
your clarity, in your truth, in your alignment with what feels divine for you so that you're holding space for a person in a different way from that place, right? Like empathy is like, I'm joining you in what you're feeling. And there's something great about not feeling alone in what you're feeling. And then compassion for me is like, I'm holding space and I am loving you, but I'm not necessarily joining you in the place you're in. Um, nor do I feel I necessarily need to, to hold space for you in this wildly loving way and in deep belief um, in your ability to hold space for yourself beyond whatever it is you're going through. Does that make sense? It, it does. I mean, you've, you've touched on a bunch of things that I had not even considered. Um, so, it, so, you know, I, I, Will it be uncomfortable for you if I keep referencing the book, knowing that? No, it's, not it's, no. It's, okay, okay. Please do whatever okay. you need. <laughs> so, I mean, in the book, you you speak about the fact that there's a difference between sympathy and empathy, and that was not something I'd considered. You you touch on forgiveness, and you talk about in a workshop the woman who came up to you and said, you know, the line is like, "My stepfather hurt me in this way. I am not ready to forgive." Yeah. I was raised you know, my mom remarried and I was raised in a household where my stepfather had the manic side of bipolar, was uh, an alcoholic, a very angry person. I mean, part of probably why I have the generalized anxiety disorder I have, I would believe is because of this pressure cooker childhood I grew up in. And I left my home when I was 16 and I'm not ready. Like for years, people have said, lack of forgiveness is like drinking poison and then expecting the other person to die. Mm -hmm. um, I have no interest in forgiving that person. So, so as I, as I worked through the different essays, the different life moments, a few thoughts came to me first, gosh, if you shared this much, what didn't go into the book? <laughs> like what bar, what, what story or what bar has to be passed to not make it in the book when you talk about just the most revealing stories, including, you know, um, the death of your parents, of your older yeah. brother, of your roommate, of as a child, um, embarrassing yourself and wetting your pants, um, being part of a cult. I mean, it's just so revealing that I'm like, I wonder what else was in there. So that was thought one thought two was you have seemed to live an artistic, you, you seem to have an art artist's soul and, and you have seemed to both have the pressure of like, I want progress. I want success. And yet at the same time you list off all the different things where you're like, I tried this and I tried this and I tried this and I was obsessed with it. And so, so, so there was that where I was like, Oh, this man is chasing or pursuing the passions that are most relevant to him and look at the beautiful outcome from this. Maybe I got to give myself more of those opportunities. And then the third thing is there's seems to be a lot of time. Like you have lived so much life in your life and you have so much ahead of you that it gave me hope yeah. to say that if I were to slow down just a little bit, and pursue some of these artistic areas, these passions, chase those, those things down that, that may not have a clear ending. Not only did it work out for Scott, it seems, but it could work out for me. And there's still lots of time. Like those were the three main takeaways I had from your story. I know I just threw a lot at you. No, no, no. It's good. I'll start with the third is yeah, of course. It's like the, I think a thing I like to remind myself and people all the time is like, it's not too late. How could it be too late? Here we are right now. Like all we ultimately have is right now. And now this now, and now this now it's right. Like this is all we have to work with ultimately. So it's not too late. Like it's, yeah, it's too late for me to come become a professional tennis player. Like I get it. There are certain <laughs> things for which it's too late, but in general, the things that we lock onto as why didn't I start it sooner? Or, you know what I mean? It's all bullet. Can I swear on your podcast? It's all, bullet. you know, like that's, that's the thing in, in what I've, uh, what I've gotten better and better at is paying attention to the things that my mind tell me that are in no way serve me and are not rooted in truth. It's rooted in conditioning. It's rooted in the expectations of others. It's rooted in these stories and rule books that we abide by that have no relevance, right? So this idea that you could in any way it could ever be too late for you to establish with yourself a better relationship, a more loving relationship, or that it could be ever too late 
to forgive someone if you feel inclined to forgive to forgiveness. I don't think forgiveness is something we choose out of the sky. That's not how, how it works. I do think, however, if you see something as unforgivable, you're not going to find your way there. You know, if you've created a wall to it and a no to it, you're not even incentivized to go to it. And yet I believe if I'm committed to forgiveness as I am, I'll always find my way there, you know, in when it, when it happens. And so, yeah, it's not too late. That's what I'd say to that for anything you, you want and, and desire. And like, why wouldn't you, if it's something you feel called to do, why wouldn't you, you put your energy toward doing it as long as it feels right to put your energy because toward it always doing it. feels like it comes at a risk or a cost. Everything right? does. Everything I, I know, does. but, but that's, that's, that's the yeah. thing where I'm like, I'm like, I, you know, I look at your story and I go, okay, it comes at a cost but it seems to have worked out. Um, th- your story is one of the first that shows, a, it spends a lot of time on the bad things and plucks out the lessons and the beauty from them to teach us how beautiful life can be. Whereas most spend a lot of time on the highlight reel and you've done the opposite, which is like probably what draws me so much to it's probably why, you know, I want you on the, we do hard things podcast. Cause it's like the beauty is in the mess and the pain and then the reflection on it. Right. You know what the beauty is it can be in everything, not just the mess and the pain. The beauty is in like the ease, the beauty is in comfort, the beauty is in connection. There's beauty to be found in everything. It's like where how are we focusing our lens? What am I what am I inspired to see? What's my intention? And and I've learned this about the past, is that it it feels like we've been I, I use con- the word conditioned a lot because it, it, uh, we are conditioned beings from the time we're very, very young, mm-hmm. it, first and foremost by the people who raise us, but then by the world, we're constantly interpreting messages in that way. But I think it's become so normal to reflect on the aspects of our past that were painful and to like mire ourselves in them and just be in the pain and talk about the pain and process the pain without necessarily moving ourselves to a place where we've achieved maybe some sort of healing or perspective around it. So I think two things about that. One is I do an exercise in one of my workshops with people. I have them reflect on a painful experience in their past. And, um, I ask them to bring to that experience, to consider the benefits that have come from that experience over time that would not be a part of their lives had they not experienced that thing. And I'm not asking them to be grateful for the experience. It's not like I look on my parents being murdered and I feel grateful that that happened to me. But what I am able to do is to at least look through, look at it now, especially with time. I, it's, I was 14, I'm about to be 50. So it's, it'll be 36 years this year. It's like, there are aspects to my life, benefits to my life, concrete benefits to my life that I never would have realized could never have been shown to me had I not lost my parents and in the way that I lost them, right? One, the the relationship I have with my siblings, I don't believe would be the same had we not all gone through that together. And that's a beautiful thing. I have a very, a tight knit family and a good relationship with my family you know, the strength we're able to see, the resilience we're able to see by surviving difficult things that we've gone through. And the thing about it is it's like, I'm not living in denial about any of the pain that I also went through and I can still cry about it. You know, they'll, they'll, it's like, absolutely. And, and I'm not going to give my energy over to that. It's, I don't need to, I don't feel compelled to it. I I'm look, I look at the ways that that doesn't necessarily serve me in my present moment right now. And I'm really intentional about being in my life in a way that is supporting, creating more meaning, more connection, more joy. Right. And, and, and also it's been a long time, so I wouldn't be doing that anyway. I wouldn't be yeah. focusing on that but, loss. But, but I heard you, I heard you do this when you talked about your feature film, for example, like, can you share that story? Yeah. The Oogie loves. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, what, what I loved about it was I was like, Oh my goodness. Oh, like every step I'm like, Oh my goodness. It's like, yeah, it was I, so I run, I, I've, I've run a business for 15 years. And so it's just like <laughs> my greatest fear is failing at a fraction of the level you quote unquote failed at. Yeah. And then the end of the chapter, I was like, I, I went for a walk with my wife right after reading it and I was like, I have to tell you this story. It's like the greatest reframe <laughs> in the world. Um, and so when you talk about 
yeah, the, the, the fact that these life moments can serve you. I think this story illustrates it better than anything else. Yeah. And we, we, we so often probably almost always don't know it in the moment necessarily how we're being served, you know? So with the Oogie loves, it was this children's film that I wrote and it got released in more than 2000 theaters in the U S it was independently financed an independent film, but it's still, that's a massive release. 2000 screens is considered an extra wide release and uh, yeah, an extra wide release. And it still holds the title for the lowest grossing extra wide, wide release in history. Like it's the biggest flop still of all time. And that I can laugh about now and feel light about now when it happened. And you know, right away, because numbers come in the first night at the Friday night that it came out, or I think it was released on Wednesday because it was for the Labor Day weekend, but it was a clearly a massive, yeah. Um, yeah, and what, and I think what the public doesn't realize is they think of producers, maybe, you know, standing up there getting Oscars. They think of directors, you know, in control of it. What they don't realize, you know, I went to film school and I've been in this industry that, that the film writer, the screenplay writer is the one who is, who is crafting everything and giving it over to the others to create and bring to life and produce. So this is, this is your baby. I mean, this is the thing that you spent time imagining and conceiving and, 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 and working on and being part of the production team and all of those things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which was all very exciting. You know, it was, it was, it was a mix for sure. But by the time, let's just say this, by the, the time leading up to the, the launch of the film, I was feeling very excited and, um, and then it bombed and it was, cr- I mean, not just commercially, but it was critically panned like really harshly. So, um, and cloyingly unbearable is one thing I remember for sure. One of the critics comments <laughs> and, and it was so it, because built into that film, not only just the ego d- dimension of being like the artistic involvement, but also, you know, I was seeing sequels, like that was what was being buzzed about. And I was seeing an entire financial future being paved for me. Yeah. You're going to develop children's toys and IP totally and, and all everything. You're going to be on the lunch boxes. There's going to totally. be a little plastic doll singing along. Yeah. And it was like, so that was really exciting also. And so all of that was just in a day, basically like, that, that dream was gone. And then dealing with the, the feelings of just embarrassment about all of it and, and shame and all. And, and what I learned from that is, which you've learned in your life and we've all learned to diff- varying degrees is that it doesn't kill you. You know, it was like, I was depressed for two weeks, you know, in like a real funk for a couple of weeks. And then, and then I was like, okay, now what? And Oh, and part of the story, what I write about in there, which is, this is when we never know the seeds we're planting. It's like at that time, one of the PR guys was like, start, start a Facebook page, which I didn't even really know what that was at the time. And, and he's like, start a Facebook page as the writer and you can inter- interact with fans and promote the movie. So it's separate from a Facebook profile. Now everyone has Facebook pages and it's very common. Um, so I started one and then there weren't really fans to the movie. So I didn't have anyone to interact with and I wasn't promoting it, but I'm like, Oh, I have this page, this author page, writer page. What do I want to write about? And that's when I started, you know, sharing my thoughts about love and forgiveness and the things that I write about. And that page just, you know, started to grow and evolve. And it's, I really credit the expansion of that page, in, in, in great part for why big love exists, because I mean, the, my publisher loved the book, but well, and they, especially with memoirs and especially memoirs with unknown people, you have to have a platform. You know, the fact that I could show up not only with the book proposal, but with a platform and say, I have this many people following me, it, it incentivizes them. You know, it, it allowed them to say yes, I think in a more comfortable way. And that page only exists be, maybe it would have existed anyway, but it's the Oogie loves that prompted it. And it felt like, Oh, so the, these are how these seeds are being harvested because now J- big love exists, which is a book I love and feel great about. And that's out there in the world in a way that it might not have been though. It could have been because, because we never know, but never know. Yeah. But I really believe the Oogie loves what, you know, that was part of the seed planting for big love for sure. Yeah. Because it's that fear that it's that fear of failure and that, 
perfectionist trait in myself that keeps me when I talked about how inspiring I found your pursuit of these arts and the time that you give it. And the fact that, um, that life appears to be long and you've just kind of given that, that time. I don't know if you feel under the gun or behind or delayed or like it cost you too much or any of those feelings, but, but what, what I have not accounted for in my own life is that even in the failure or the risk of failure or the perceived risk of failure, that the outcome could still lead to a beautiful place if you just zoom out far enough. Absolutely. And, and if you trust the outcome is going to lead to a beautiful place, no matter what, if you can look at it through that lens, if you're really zooming out, it's like, if you fail, there's going to be some nuggets in that failure. There's going to be something in there for you. If you choose to reflect on your life through that lens and why wouldn't we choose to reflect on our lives through that lens? Because the alternative to that is like, Oh my God, this was just a fucking failure and I got nothing out of it. And I put this much time of my life into it. It's like, why would I, why would I offer that perspective? It doesn't even make intuitive sense to me because it doesn't in any way serve me. And that's the one thing I notice we do with our past so often is we use our past in a way that doesn't allow us to move forward courageously in this present moment, because we focus on the aspects of our past that keep us locked into our fear. I failed that thing five times. So I'm for sure going to fail it again, even though my heart is like, try again. This is what you're about. This is what you feel. And it's like, but I failed five times. So what if we say, what if we reframe it? It's like, I gave my energy to this five times. I have the experience of trying this five times. I've looked through this lens of failure five times and who I am right now is someone I've never been before. So all of these things, actually I can use to inspire me to take the risk instead of using them the way we do to prevent me from taking the risk. Like you're always going to feel fear. We always feel fear. I'm always afraid of everything, you know, not always afraid of everything, but like pretty much the things that my heart is calling me to do, the way my heart is asking me to show up always instills fear because what we understand intuitively is that not even just intuitively from every angle, we're going to be judged no matter what. And that fear of judgment is so much about, it's even, it's what's underwriting. It's kind of vibrating beneath that fear of failure because it's like, what are people going to think of us if we fail? What are the people going to think of us if this is a, a bomb or whatever? And, and that is so often the thing that prevents us from taking the risks. And I've gotten much better at, look, I, I, I'm sure if, I could think about things that I still feel so afraid of that I haven't stepped forward into it. But in general, I've gotten much better at moving forward with my fear because I know that my fear is always going to be there. And so I've gotten in a friendly relationship, friendlier relationship with my fear. What I write about in, in big love, it's helped me so much because when you are in negotiation with something that you see as an enemy, as a tyrant with its boot on your neck, it's much harder to move forward in that negotiation. And that's what my fear felt like to me energetically. It was the thing preventing me from living my best life. And I felt like it held all the power. And I went to this workshop with Elizabeth Gilbert and Rob Bell and Elizabeth Gilbert had us write this letter to ourselves from our fear. And I'd never done this exercise and it was really powerful. Anyone listening, if, if this is resonating with you, do this exercise, write yourself a letter from your fear and allow your fear to express to you why it's in your life, what its purpose is. And what I found when I allowed my fear to have a voice in that way, all of the things it was telling me was, I just want to keep you safe. I just want to protect you. I don't want you to be judged. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to fail. I don't want people to misunderstand you. It was this very kind voice. The intentions behind everything it was doing felt really kind and gentle and supportive. And I was like, oh, my fear is actually my friend. It just does its job in a way. Like it just <laughs> always, you know, it always <laughs> says no. It's like wired to say, no, anytime I'm going to be uncomfortable in any way, my fear is going to say, don't do it. Yeah. Whether it's running into a burning building or sending in an essay, you know, to, to, or to, sitting on a balcony drinking <laughs> Chardonnay. <laughs> I got to tell you that story. It's like, um, I like to catastrophize things. I got four kids. Uh, and every, like if you want, 
if you want someone to play worst case scenario with you, trust me. Like, so when I hear the, your story of sitting on the 50th floor balcony, somehow thinking that someone will, will be able to scale it and break in and attack you. I'm just like, okay. This guy's on the same page as me. We both freak out about the most unrealistic things. Yeah. But what happens if we get, what happens if we become friends with our fear and those conversations aren't as heavy? What happens when all the things you're afraid of about failure are being presented to you through the lens of someone who's actually your friend and trying to support you and someone to whom you can say, I hear you and I'm still going to do it. What happens when we get practiced at moving forward with our fear, it becomes much more natural and fear starts not, not, it stops becoming the thing that prevents us from moving forward, you know, and that takes practice. You know, there's a, there's a great, the other thing I feel called to, to you to, to, to check out if it, if it feels right. Are you familiar with Tim Ferriss? I am. Do you know his fear setting thing? I don't No. Look up Tim Ferriss and look up fear setting. And he has this practice that is a really great way to approach your fear because he guides you. And it's this writing exercise that he takes you through, but it allows you to look at your fear through a much more rational lens and to actually see it written down, takes the charge out of it in a different way. And it's, it's very impactful. Check it out and tell me, send me an email at some point. If you do do it, I'd be curious to see how it, what you feel about it. I'm going to follow up with you on that now. Um, so, so I, I, I believe, you know, I believe in different frameworks and different structures and um, I've never heard someone who has been so focused on fear. Cause you do mention fear and it, and it does appear to drive you or, or it did drive you in the past. And I've never heard people speak about fear almost as much as they speak about shame. I mean, I, I didn't have the ability to do like a word check in your manuscript, but you mentioned the word shame, like hundreds of times I have to assume. And I can understand, well, I can empathize, let's say, you know, as, um, gosh, I mean, of you, you know, you you said you were getting to 50. So, so, you know, coming to age in the mid eighties or nineties as a gay man who was, you know, in Michigan and then relocated to San Francisco and all of these things, I can understand it, I guess. I'm not saying that's the cause of your shame, but, but how, how, help me understand, I guess, how you've been able to work through shame because it does hold a lot of people back and how you've been able to come to terms with this or fight it. Bringing awareness to it first and foremost, you know, what I understand is that my shame, most of it is again, rooted in, the conditioning, the conditioned ways we've been brought up to believe is an okay way to love someone. You know, it, this is okay to say, this is okay to feel. And every time we're not living in alignment with what those, these outside forces are saying is okay. We are naturally, we're producing shame inside of ourselves. We are naturally feeling shameful. The reason I talk about shame a lot and fear a lot is because these are the things holding people back. Mm -hmm. People are not being in their authenticity. They're not sharing what they feel called to share in the world in part because they're afraid about how they're going to be judged and in part because they feel shamed about what their deepest truths reveal about them. And when you start to share yourself more openly, so for me, dealing with shame is about verbalizing it, announcing it. And that is the only way I found to help me really move through it because shame lives in our secrecy. It lives in that unwillingness to share the things because we feel too shameful about them. But one of the great gifts of the time we live in in the, the resources we have, you know, the online resources we have right now is that one of the most insidious, I think, voices of shame, it, it tries to tell us we're alone in whatever it is we're experiencing. And even though I knew as a gay, I knew as a gay kid, I wasn't alone in it, even though I felt very alone in it. And it was the eighties and you're not seeing a lot of examples, but there were some, I knew I wasn't the only gay person on the planet. Um, but, but, but I, and I mean, I don't know if these things overlap or not, but my understanding, I mean, so I was born in 83, so I'm a little bit younger than you, but, um, my understanding for most of my gay friends is it was not a great time. I mean, there was the, the fear of HIV, there was oppression, there was all kinds of things swirling around in the kind of 
political, you know, cultural environment. So, um, you know, my kids now are coming to age. I, I want to believe in a more progressive and open society where, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to forget in 20 or 30 years, how much things can change. Absolutely. No. Yeah. It was a completely different world in the eighties, you know, and, but, but getting back to the idea of shame, like if you're feeling like your shame is holding, or if you just don't want to be sitting in your shame, whatever your shame might be, the shame I had about losing my hair in early in college, I was never without a baseball cap on my head. You know, I was so, so embarrassed and thought I was just a freak because everyone had hair, you know, I was 19 and, and going bald. And it was like, this is not the reality I can face. And then you start taking your cap off, you know, my senior year, I was getting braver. And it's like, you see, you, you recognize you survive it. And, and if you're feeling like not you, the universal, you, anybody listening, if there's some shame you're holding on to, and it really is preventing you from being alive in, in energized in your truth, I encourage you to Google whatever it is. I encourage you to look up Facebook groups or meetup groups, because there are lots of other people out there who are living with this same shame. I can guarantee it. And when you start to, if you're not ready to verbalize it to someone, because the moment you share it with someone, the moment you announce it, the moment I started sharing with my closest friends, I'm gay. It was like hundreds of elephants lifting off my shoulder, the relief because shame can, the power of shame, it, it dissipates immediately. Once you start to speak that thing you feel ashamed of, because it's no longer living in secrecy. And, and we, and if you're not in a place where you feel courageous enough to announce your shame, find people out there who are start reading the stories of others who are sharing with the world, the very thing that you feel so ashamed of the very thing that's holding you back, start seeing, start realizing that other people are out there sharing this. Other people are out there living this way. Other people are out there doing their thing without this. And it's going to get you to a point eventually, I believe where you're going to feel okay, calling up someone and saying, this is the thing I've been holding back. And what we come to discover so often, like with my bald head, it's so silly. So many of the things that feel so shameful and we're so like paralyzed by it inside of ourselves with time and perspective. It's like, Oh my God, that was so silly. I think of all the energy I put into hiding my bald head in college. It was so much energy. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I had a joy. I loved college. I had a great college experience, but I'm like all of that energy and all the energy hiding my sexuality in college. It's like all of that energy could have gone to so many other things. You know what I mean? It's like, and, and here we are right now. And part of this, I want to, I just want to, to, to say a few things about self-love because I feel like so much of it starts with loving ourselves and, and being willing to loving ourselves and being committed to loving ourselves. Because when you start to, to show up for yourself with more love and more compassion and more gentleness, you build within yourself a deeper courage to take risks in your life. Because what I know, Mark, without question now is that no matter what I do and if I fail or whatever, I have my back. I know that, that if people judge me, I am going to show up for myself with love and with compassion. And it makes me feel more capable to take risks because I know I've got my back. I know I'm not going to be on the other side of what the choices I make, belittling myself and kicking myself and saying, you're a piece of it. And why did you do that? And you're a failure. That is not my relationship with myself at all. Even though my mind wants to go there at times, I'm really, really practiced in returning to love. And, and that is another thing that helps us transcend our shame. Because when we have so much love for ourselves, shame just cannot live in that space. It's not where shame lives. It's also not where fear lives in the same way. Fear is a part of our lives. So fear is always going to be showing up. But again, when you know you've got your back, when you mark whatever you're holding yourself back from doing that, that fear of failure, when you know you're going to be there as your like greatest support and foundation, it is going to help you move forward. Those fears aren't going to be able to compete in the same way with the amount of love that you have to show up for yourself. And if someone's listening, it's like, I don't know how to love myself. I don't know how to love myself. As I hear from many people start doing things because it all starts with our thoughts Thoughts, words, and actions, thoughts, words, and actions. I'm sure you know this. It's like when we realize that, that 
we do not have to be owned by our thoughts. We can instead become the director of our thoughts, a more proactive director of our thoughts. So what I mean by that is when you're aware that your thoughts are locked in a cycle of self-abuse and they're telling you you're lazy and stupid and you're going to fail, the moment you're aware that that's what you're doing is the moment you have an opportunity to shift that way of thinking. It's the moment you have the opportunity to offer yourself something loving, something affirming, remind yourself of the time you've succeeded in whatever it is you need to do to shift that cycle. And the more often you do that, the more often, every time you're aware you're beating out of yourself, offer yourself words of love and encouragement. It's life-changing. It's life-changing and it feels overwhelming at first because when you become aware of how often you're beating it out of yourself, you're going to see, oh my God, this is, the, this is the majority of my mental energy in relationship to myself is rooted in negativity and self-judgment and self-abuse. But the beauty of bringing awareness to that, only when you have awareness of that, can you create a change around it right? And that's when you can actively and consciously offer yourself different words. And then it becomes, for me now, that habit is so second nature. It's like, I don't stay locked in self-abuse for very long at all. And it's an instantaneous switch because I'm practiced at it. And you know this, we all know this, the things that we practice at with practice, you become more expert at it right? And we can apply this to every area of our lives. If you practice at getting in a better relationship with your fear around anything, failure, judgment, whatever, you're going to become better at it. It's going to become an easier process for you, right? And then we have to follow it up with action. It's like, and and when we do, we understand again how powerful we are. That's really the energy I'm living in my, in my life right now. It's this understanding my belief is that the energy that created the trees and oceans and stars and planets and galaxies is an energy that is alive within us. It created us too. For me, there's no separation. So whatever that energy is, some people call it God or source energy or life, whatever that energy is, we are fueled by it. And when we remember that that energy is alive within us and that energy is boundless and limitless as is evidenced by everything we're witnessing in the world and beyond, how could we ever come to any sort of belief that we are not powerful enough to create for ourselves the kind of life we want to be living, right? Your, your thing is we, we can do hard things, right? Or that's, we do hard things. Mm. My, one of my favorite writers is Glennon Doyle. And she always says we can do hard or one of you says, whichever one, I don't know. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. And it's, and, and the only reason why I, I want to wave this flag is because, um, we live in fear. We live in doubt. We don't take action. We think small. <clears throat> I had this thought the other day and I've shared it a few times, but if, if you can, think much bigger than your comfort zone. And if you put in the time and the work and the effort, I kind of believe it takes what it takes. Mm -hmm. You know, Trevor Moed has a great book where he talks about just, it takes what it takes. If you want it and you're willing to do it, eventually it will come. Now it may not be the path you want. It may not be the time you want. It might not be the level you want, but it'll come. And if that's the case, then almost all of us are walking around with like a genie in a bottle where we get three wishes or four wishes or 10 wishes or whatever it is. You don't know yet what you have to do or how hard it will be. And you don't know how long it will take, but if you can dream big enough and you're willing to dedicate the time, the effort, and to do it, um, those things will happen. And, uh, I think that for me, it's like, but it only comes if you're willing to do the hard or the difficult or the scary things. If you're always going to live in your comfort zone, then none of those things are going to manifest or come true. Yeah. Because so often our comfort zone is, is created by the fears we believe in a hundred percent. Right. So if we, you know, the, the other thing I'm, I'm sitting with a lot these days is this, this idea that to achieve anything, you've got to like work your ass off and do it. It's like a grind. And, and, and it's not that that hard work isn't valuable, but I also think there's value in considering 
that not everything has to be a grind necessarily, that maybe that is something we're conditioned to believe as well, especially in the United States where, you know, people take pride in working 80 hours a week as if that's something to take pride in. And I'm not judging that, but it's like, I don't, I'm, I'm not, that's not what my goal is. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, there are other ways to go about things without us feeling like, we have to kill ourselves in order to do it. I had this good friend who created this wonderful business. And when I would talk to her about it, she would like, it was always the same refrain, like this job is murdering me, you know? And it was like, the language was so harsh and she since transcended that and doesn't view it through that lens at all. But it's like, what happens if we open our, again, broaden our perspective, open ourselves up to the possibility that yes, we, we it takes what it takes hundred percent, but maybe it doesn't have to take, 80 hours a week or me killing myself or me sacrificing all this time. I feel I'm sacrificing where I could also be spending some of that time with friends. What if, and again, this is, this is where I am now. You're catching me at a very, but what if, what if I focus on really just putting myself in deepest alignment with that source energy within me that created our planet and other planets and everything else. What if as much as possible, this is very, I've also been listening to Abraham Hicks a lot lately. So I have the, who's a teacher of law of attraction. I have that energy going in me, but, but I love it because the essence of that message is as they communicated, as I interpret it is whenever we're feeling negative emotion it's a sign that we're out of alignment with that source energy within us or with the God within us, because that place within me, when I feel connected to it, when I feel connected to the universe of love, that's flooding forth all the time, or the, the peacefulness, the stillness in that place, I only feel at ease. Hmm. There's never anything else going on. There's not sadness going on. There's not anger going on. There's not blame going on. There's only this general sense of deep okayness and ease and love, right? So how could I not be served by giving myself over to that energy as often as possible, knowing that what's created from that place is this sense of ease and love, and then allow that feeling to be what guides me through my life? I think so often what we're doing is we're using our mind. We're being led by our mind. And then we give to our heart whenever we're able to give to our heart. But what happens when we're being led by our heart in understanding my understanding is that our mind is not the one that's meant to lead us. That's not how we've been designed. We've been designed to be led from a much deeper place and the mind, this brilliant imaginative mind is here to play the supporting role, to deal with all the log logistics, to make the plans, to do the thing, to put words to the things we can't really put words to. Right. But, but I love the feeling it from an energetic place of like using my mind as the supporting player as the assistant, as the executive yeah. assistant, and really being led by my heart, really being led by what intuitively feels right and seeing what gets created from that place. Right. So what you're describing, I am so ready for. And if you met me six months ago, though, I would have been like, this guy is a hippie. Like, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to judge you or anything, but, but I would have been like, this is getting really woo woo and all of this stuff now. Um, and yet like, you know, in the last six months, the work that I've been doing and, and you know, what I often ask myself is, is, is I'm, am, you know, am I better off this year than I was last year? And last year at this time, Oh heck yeah. I'm better off today than, you know, if we remember what was happening last year, but then I, I asked myself, well, what about two years ago? Like two years ago, I had everything put together, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm still better off now than I was two years ago because I'm, I'm more in the pursuit of the things that you're speaking about and I'm coming to understand them and I'm coming to accept them. And it's not that I'm judging myself and I'm not trying to judge you, but, it, but to anyone who is not where you're at now because you have been so committed to this for so long, they would hear this and, and think that, you know, well, that's easy for you to say, um, you know, look at how successful you are. Look at what you've been able to accomplish and do, or, um, it just all sounds very woo woo as people say, um, I guess, how would you respond to, to meeting people where they're at when they're not ready to hear this message? Me, the way I would meet any person if in general is with a clear certainty that 
you are able to create the kind of life you want to be living. And anything inside of you that is telling you differently is bold. It's all fear. It's all coming from your mind. It's all coming from your ego. If that's too woo, -woo that's too woo. -woo. But the, the reality is, so if you are, you have a choice, you can either believe these thoughts that are preventing you from moving yourself forward and live in what you're living and feel if what you're feeling about where you are in your life is like or disappointed, or like you could be realizing so much more, you have a choice. And, and really matter of factly, it's you can start giving your energy to different thoughts that support you taking action in a way that helps you to create the kind of life you want to be living. You either have to be, this is going to go, I'm going to go from woo woo to like matter of fact, like it's basically hit or get off the pot. If you want to change your life, what are you doing to change it? What are you doing every day? What choices are you making every day? When you look at the choices you're making, are they actually in alignment with you creating the kind of life you want to be living? If so, make more of those choices. This is one plus one equals two. This is so basic and so simple. And this is really the core of everything. If you did no other thing in your life, but paid attention to the choices you're making and make more choices that are aligned with the kind of life you want to be living and start eliminating the choices that aren't aligned with the kind of life you want to be living, your life changes overnight, right? But what I encourage people to do along with this is like the life that you want to be living, what is that rooted in? What is it? Is it rooted in is it rooted in this idea that you want to have more connection in your life and more love in your life and more peace in your being? Or is it rooted to this idea that I want people to respect me and I want to be successful and I want to, and, and I'm not judging either of those choices, but I think we've come to understand and have been shown in every book and by every, everything for many, many years that the money alone is not going to be your ticket to happiness. The relationship alone is not going to be your ticket to happiness. The achieving all of your career things alone is not going to be the ticket to happiness. So what is that ticket? Whenever anyone's talking about what's missing from that equation, what's missing is a deep sense of connection to self, a deep sense of connection to community and other people. It's like the, this is the meat of what it, for me, what it means to be a successful human being. It's like, how do I feel? I'm inspired by people who are out there and I get their sense of joy much more than I get their sense of they have a ton of money. Like that's not, do you know what I'm saying? And I say this yeah. to someone who would like a lot more money than yeah. I have <laughs> for sure. And I'm, I'm going to put energy into that. And like, I want that. And so I'm not, I'm not against any of that, but it's like, if you're the people who are miserable, they're not miserable because they haven't achieved their career successes. They're attaching their misery to that, but then they're going to achieve those career successes. And then they're still going to be miserable. And then they're because now I have everything I thought I wanted and I'm still unhappy. And how, how often do we hear of this? How many people do we know who on paper have it all and they're still unhappy? It's because that's not where it comes from. It comes from something deeper that comes from the woo woo. It comes from the understanding that love, compassion, that this is what creates happiness. This is what creates the peace we're all seeking. And we can have that and all the beautiful aspects of our career. It's going to make all those other things that much more beautiful, right? I don't know. For me, it's common sense, but I also hear how it's woo woo. <laughs> and I I'm, I'm there. I'm there right now. Can I, I don't say know something you... to you personally? I would love to hear from you. Yes. You, you, your energy is dynamic. Like you're like, I experience you and I'm like, this is a, a man who's going to realize whatever it is he wants to realize. It's very clear. It's just, it's what you're emitting. And it's not that I also don't, can't sense the fears that you were referencing in part because you reference them and in part because we all have them, but you're, there's nothing stopping you. There is nothing stopping you. Not even all those fears can stop you unless you let them, right? Yeah. They don't have to. They just don't have to. Thank, thank you for that. And I, during the day, I believe that. Yeah. It's, it's in the evening and the nighttime. I don't, honestly. And so it's, um, 
I've figured out, I've, I've figured out that, that what I'm working towards, I call my new life. Mm -hmm. And like yesterday I had a day where I spent my entire day in my new life and it was soul filling and it was amazing. And part of that was, you know, yesterday morning, I get up at 4 a.m. Uh, I woke up at 3.10 and I couldn't sleep. And so I dug more into your book and I just gave myself a few hours to have a coffee and to have some time and stretch and do all of these things. And I spent the day living in my new life and I was like, I could do this all day, every day. And I see speed and I see momentum and I see growth and I see great things, but I'm still not out of my old life yet. And those those other obligations, those other things. Um, I say, it's like, you know, Carrie, right. The arm coming out of the grave. It's like, uh -huh. it grabs on to my ankle and it, it convinces me that I will be stuck in my old life. And, and so I appreciate your very kind words. Um, and I believe it most of the time, but not enough yet to not be just a hope that will come true. It doesn't and feel like a sure thing yet. It feels like a hope still. But you know what? You also said yesterday you spent most of a day in the, in the spirit of knowing, yeah. right? So that's huge. A lot of people can't even get to that place of even believing it enough. Like you do believe it enough to get you into that space or that space would never happen. That's yeah. happening. That's alive. That I'm three happen. years into this. It's, it's taken me three years to get here. And yeah, so when I hear great. a story like yours again, I think take time. It is possible. It can happen, you know, and milk those good moments, brother, because that matters. It's here's the thing. Everything is energy. We've learned this. Scientists have confirmed it. Everyone knows it. The new age world has been speaking. Everyone's like, everything is energy. So your thoughts are energy. Your words are, your actions yeah. are. So anytime you're in that good feeling place, you're vibing in there, milk it for all it's worth because it is serving. It's like money in the bank. I really believe that it's moving. It is momentum. It's all about momentum. And every time night comes and you go back to sleep, any negative momentum you've created is gone. You're sleeping and you start a new day and you start it up again. Right? So this is life. That's the other thing. It's like, we're human beings. You know, everything I'm talking about here, I'm not living in all of it all the time. You know, I'm living in all of it as much as I can. I bring as much awareness as I can. And I'm being really, really kind to myself when I'm doing things that I know aren't necessarily from in my best interest, aren't the healthiest choices. It's a really healthy choice when you're doing something unhealthy to be like, you're human. I love you anyway, right? We don't have to shame ourselves for those choices like we're used to. Now, what you as a listener and a viewer don't know is that that wasn't the end of my conversation with Scott. After I stopped the recording, uh, we spent a lot of time talking together actually through a major life change I was facing. And that day, that day, that afternoon, that Thursday afternoon in April, when we did the recording, I left the interview with Scott, realizing that my own life was out of alignment with my heart. And that fear was keeping me trapped and stuck in a version of my life that I just didn't want anymore. And so Scott's book, Big Love, this book, the conversation that I had with Scott, it helped me realize just how much I love this podcast this podcast that you're listening to, that you're watching, and the people that I get to speak with, people like Scott, the conversations that I get to share with each and every one of you. And so Scott inspired me to go all in on We Do Hard Things, not as a hobby or a side project, but as my life's mission. And that was huge for me. So Scott, I want to thank you, man. You don't you don't even know, I, did, I, I sent you a, an IG note, but you don't even know the impact that you've had on my life in the short time we've known each other. So thank you. Now, with that said, let's get into the three key takeaways from this talk. Number one, our mind is not meant to lead us, but rather our hearts are. Be led by what feels intuitively right and let your mind just play support. Number two, fear is always going to be there. It's not going anywhere. So practice befriending the fear. Don't let it stop you. And number three, for so many of us, shame drives us. Shame drives us to do things or to not do things, to beat ourselves up why we did this or didn't do that or we should have. Share your shame. Remove its power. It's the only way you can move through it. 
Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But always remember, we, you and me, aren't just dreamers, we're doers. Because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this man survived two rounds of terminal cancer, going on to climb Mount Everest and every other major mountain in the world. And he skied to the South Pole and the North Pole with only one lung. Click on the video right over there to hear this real, inspiring conversation.